Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit has taught the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the gift of the same Spirit we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Eddie conceived without sin. In um, the last sort of uh, words that Bashara spoke to us. Um, he spoke very well, as he, as he always does. Um, but in um, speaking of the importance of Jerusalem, uh, its importance in history and its importance now, uh, well, one, one could be misled into thinking that um, Jerusalem has a spiritual significance, importance now, which it doesn't have um, because of uh, our Lord having uh, ascended into heaven and the new temple in which we worship is of course the heavenly temple, the heavenly Jerusalem. And this is the a whole new stage uh, since the Ascension, since Pentecost, in the history of salvation. Um, and therefore it, it would be a terrible mistake if we were to sort of uh, exaggerate the importance of Jerusalem now. The importance of Jerusalem in history, um, right up until the temple was destroyed, uh, it, that is tremendously important, uh, but the whole meaning of, of, of God's revelation is that um, uh, it's the heavenly Jerusalem that uh, uh, that we belong to if we if we belong to Christ, and uh, any falling back into the old covenant. It's a terrible betrayal, of course. I mean, if a person has once become a Christian, and of course if a person is still living in the Old Covenant, uh, then it is our duty, our joy, uh, to work, to bring people into the New Covenant, which means really to bring them to God himself, um, uh, uh, far above the Old Covenant, although the Old Covenant is, of course, is, is uh, infinitely precious as part of the way to it in history. And um, I haven't had time to prepare th this talk at all, but um, uh, just because of, of what Bashara was, was, was saying, it seems a good sort of subject, sort of impromptu to, to um, to mention, and since we've just arrived in Jerusalem, uh, please God, we keep our hearts on the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, no matter how important, and they are, it is very important historically, um, all the various stones and things, but uh, when, when um, you get Christians talking about uh, putting, a, putting a note in the wailing wall, well, it, it can be very innocent, of course, in a child, uh, and all very sweet, but in fact, I mean, if we're praying uh, back under the old covenant to, to the remains of the, of the temple that was destroyed as a great judgment of God for the rejection of the Messiah, and we don't in fact pray to God in heaven, but are still living, you know, we'd be going right back sort of 2,000 years in a very culpable way as soon as we know anything about the history of salvation. And, and um, similarly with, with any, any other kind of uh, veneration of, of, the, of the old covenant, uh, as if that is our way of, of uniting with God, and others were ignoring Christ, who really is the way to God, and, and uh, still going back to what was a preparation for him. And so uh, we see this in the gospel again and again. Uh, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. 
the Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. That is the temple we, we, we now worship in and we, we, every time we pray we must know that. You know, in the Mass, lift up your hearts. Um, don't keep them set on this world uh, because Christ is, is in heaven and it's only through Christ that we can uh, reach God the Father. I mean, God the Father and the Son are one, of course. And, uh, um, and th th this is uh, the great um, uh, substance of the history in the Acts of the Apostles, this uh, uh, working out of this new uh, community, this new covenant, um, this new work of God, leaving behind the old covenant, uh, which uh, would have been to some extent left behind anyway, of course, but in fact in actually uh, uh, putting the Messiah to death, that, that made a sort of a terrible, uh, as it were, end, but also a wonderful end to the old covenant, because the, the, the whole point is that, that um, the church is, is the community of, of the new covenant and um, for example when we in chapter 4 of John's Gospel just a little bit later when the woman at the well um, uh, says our father she's trying to decide whether um, the uh, the Samaritan uh, center what was really God's work uh, or whether it was in Jerusalem um, as, as the, the, the members of the tribe of Judah uh, believed and uh, she says our fathers worshipped on this mountain in Samaria but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship is, is it the right I mean can you hear or am I speaking too softly you can hear all right can you good um, the woman at the well says, you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to a woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship the Father, you worship what you don't know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such the Father seeks to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And then she says, I know that Messiah is coming and he'll show us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. The, um, uh, uh, Acts of the Apostles is to a large extent the account of this separation of the church, which was truly the church, um, in Jerusalem with James, uh, became the, the, the leader of it in Jerusalem, but the, the other apostles uh, in, in increasingly led um, the growth of the church outside Jerusalem, especially, uh, particularly I should say, Peter in Antioch. If you remember the Acts of the Apostles, Antioch becomes a kind of very alive centre, whereas the, the, the church in Jerusalem is all a bit uh, in awe or, or a bit intimidated by the presence of the, of the very resistant Jews and persecution and so on, uh, but in Antioch, uh, the, the Antioch that's in, um, in Judah, in, uh, there's another Antioch, um, Pisidian Antioch, but this is the, the one that's in the Holy Land itself. In Antioch, really the Holy Spirit worked in a wonderful way and, and the faith grew and, and really became liberated from uh, the old covenant 
uh, and this, uh, as you remember, is um, uh, the whole message of St. Paul. He was sent from Antioch to, um, on, on the first missionary journey, and then he reported back to Antioch. So Antioch really became the center of the most alive part of the church. Um, uh, and it, and it, it didn't have, it wasn't sort of held back by uh, a wrong understanding of, of the law continuing. Of course, it's very important to distinguish between what is the true moral law, which remains the same from the Old Testament, and all the prescriptions of the, you know, of, of diet and, and whether you could eat this kind of meat or that kind, all those kind of things. And there was a vast number of them which were a tremendous sort of bondage they became when they were uh, thought of in themselves instead of being a part of, of truly worshipping God. And, um, but as the Antioch, and led by the Holy Spirit and Paul and Barnabas and, and others, and, and also Peter, um, probably many of you know, Peter was the, was the bishop of Antioch, or the apostle of Antioch, of course, uh, before he went to Rome. Uh, it shows how important Antioch was, because Peter is the head of the church, and um, uh, it, it's, um, you know, it's very important in, in, in understanding Peter, his life, and how he, he was first uh, the leader in Antioch. Uh, so Antioch became the center rather than Jerusalem. Um, <coughs> And, uh, and then, of course, then he went to Rome, and, and, uh, uh, and his successors have lived in Rome ever since. But um, I think that, that those were some of the things I was going to say. I mean, if you're if you, uh, reading St. Paul, um, one sees the importance of this. Um, the uh, letter to the Romans um, it's tremendously important. In, in, he's preaching the gospel that Jesus has died for our sins so that we can make an entirely new beginning uh, based on its source is in the gift of God. It's not in our own works. It's Jesus has died. He sent the Holy Spirit. All you have to do is believe. And then, of course, believing, give your life to him because he's given his life, his eternal life to us. And... Uh, uh, there, it's a whole new life based on faith and love and not, not, and not on the law which was a kind of preparation and training for that not, not on the old law as I say in the kind of dietary and all those kind of other regulations that set the Jewish people apart from other peoples but now this mission is to the nations to the whole world the moral law remains the same because it's the same for the whole world but uh, uh, all those things in particularly, which particularly were meant to set the Jewish people apart, to separate them, which was God's intention, so that they would uh, be able to grow in this knowledge of, of, of the Messiah who was to become, so that when he came they would be the special people who would protect him, above all Our Lady, to give birth to him. That was the whole mission of the Old Testament, to give birth to the Messiah. But then he, now he's coming, then the, as it were, the egg has broken open the, uh, and um, to, to go back to that preparatory phase would be like, uh, you know, well, I mean, obviously, we think of examples, but I mean, if, you, if you've told uh, someone who's got degrees in, in, goodness knows what, subjects at the university, and you tell them, well, you go back and you just sit at a little table, you know, and do the ABC as if you were a child of five. We don't want you to go around like a grown-up. You know, it would be a terrible um, absurdity. Um, and, and it would be equally absurd for us to go back to, um, to the Jewish, uh, um, you know, to, to the old covenant. And uh, again, I mean, this is, this is one passage from St. Paul. St. Paul is talking about this a lot, a lot of the time. But here is one, um, when, he, when he compares uh, tell me, you who desire to be under law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, the son of the free woman through promise, not of the flesh but of the spirit. Now this is an allegory. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery, 
She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem. We're now in the present Jerusalem. Uh, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one that doesn't bear, break forth and shout, thou who art not in travail, not giving birth, for the desolate hath more children than she who hath a husband. Now we, brethren, like Isaac, are, are children of promise. But as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave and her son, for the son of the slave shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So brethren, we are not children of the slave but of the free woman. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand fast therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. The whole point is, is through the gift of the Holy Spirit then, then our hearts are set free uh, to truly desire, long to serve, uh, to do anything for God because uh, the Holy Spirit, has, uh, through faith, the Holy Spirit enables us to live for love and God is love and that is the freedom we're given. Um, and it is a terrible thing if, if we cease to live for love, if we cease to live for God, because Christ has opened the way and it's wonderful beyond words, the whole of the heavenly kingdom, all the choirs of angels. And we're not only with the angels worshipping, we're actually united with God. He died that he might be in us and we might be in him. That God the Father might be in, human be in each human being and each human being should be in God the Father for all eternity. If we really believe that, well then we are set free and, and, and we know how awful it would be to go back to living under the law. And this is what um, St. Paul was, was uh, preaching and what we need to hear again and again and again, that we, that we live from that love because our hearts have been set free by the Holy Spirit. Um, well, the situation now of, of the Jewish people, um, so we, which we meet, of course, um, in the Holy Land, um, there are some who are very, very, the, the, the Hasidim, they're called, I think, um, who are, you, you could say they're just old covenant believers who've stood terribly firm on, um, on, the, on the old covenant and you meet them in Jerusalem. Um, I, it's quite beautiful in some, way, in some ways, because um, the, I, as I remember it, there's a whole quarter of Jerusalem that they have a little, not a quarter, but I mean, a little area, where you can't have any television or anything like that. And if you do, you're liable to get, get stoned to death. I mean, they, they feel very strongly about it. Well, I'm very, I feel strongly about it as well, but I wouldn't stone people to death because they're watching the television, but I mean, I've, I've, something very good about that, I think. But anyway, there are a few, a, a small number of real Old Covenant believers. And then, of course, that there's um, a lot, and of which the Hasidim are a very extreme form. Um, uh, and um, then there's, of course, there's a lot in modern Judaism in, in, this, in the Holy Land a lot of the Jews are very, well, I mean, all of them, it seems to me, are absolutely determined to, um, uh, you know, for the uh, defense and, and victory of, of Judaism. But, but uh, apparently, I mean, I, I think it's correct to say that the majority of them are atheists. That it's a complete separation. They're no, they don't no, no really believe in God at all, but they're very strong about the, the, the Jewish people so that, I mean, it's not for me to speak how much they actually believe in God and how much they don't, but I mean, the, 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 the strict Jews are scandalized by all the sort of political Jews and there's a whole, that whole situation um, is, is just a reality that one has to, one needs to be aware of. Um, 
and and um, and then there's a then there's a, a growing number, uh, it seems at the present time, of of what are called messianic Jews. It's a very important um, fact because it's growing. I mean, I've heard um, uh, from, from someone who, who knows a lot about it that in every town and village now, something it seemed to him something like a third are in fact Messianic Jews, it, it, when you actually get to know them. Um, I, I think that there must be an exaggeration. I think of, of ones who are believing at all in anything, um, there is a large, a growing number of Messianic Jews. Um, I can't quite believe it, it comes to a third, which, but there are, and so um, I, I, I've got a friend, uh, you may have read uh, one of his books, Roy Schumann. I don't know if you've read any of his books, but um, he is an a, a American from a Jewish family, and uh, he had a sort of crisis in his life at about the age of 30, and Our Lady appeared to him. And, um, and then he knew that, that, you know, that Christ was the truth, and, and uh, he he he, uh, he looked up in the telephone. He didn't know any Christians or anything else. He was walking along a desolate a desolate beach, and um, he uh, he looked up in the telephone book and saw there was a church, you know, near where he was living or something. So he went where he was staying on that holiday, and he he went along. And uh, but the the but the pastor he went to. Um, uh, he, he, you know, talked to him about Christ and said, oh, it's wonderful, you're a Jew, and tried to help him and so on. But then, then in the conversation, he said, well, how does Our Lady fit in with all this? And, and this pastor said, oh, well, don't, don't worry about that at all. You know, that's the main, the great thing is Christ. Well, he'd only become a Christian through this apparition. So he, he, he tried to find some <laughs> Christians who believed in Our Lady. And, uh, and he found um, the Catholic faith and he became a Catholic and that's his whole life now, giving talks on it and everything else. And he, he, he's come to the, uh, uh, to the Holy Land and, and given talks and things. And um, it's him, I mean, he says how, uh, um, how few there are who've become Catholic, but there are, it's a tremendous growing movement of Messianic Jews so some, that's something we need to pray for because God is working in them to bring them to Christ, but to a kind of... Uh, it's not, generally speaking, Protestantism because there's enormous variety. A lot of these Messianic Jews say, well, we believe in Christ, but we don't believe in St. Paul. So it, it's, it's, in a sense, sometimes worse than Protestantism. But they all adopt all different views. They're up at Marble Arch always with very beautiful signs, that, you know, proving that Jesus is the Messiah and so on, and we are Jews and so on. So it's all very beautiful and hopeful, but there is a big block between that and, and the church. Uh, and, it, and it's obviously very important we pray and do what we can to bring them into the church. Otherwise, the whole thing is, is radically incomplete. A Christianity without the church is, is like... Um, you know, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Well, the church is, is the branches. Uh, the vine can't produce any fruit without the branches. If you don't have the church, uh, there's no fruit really. The whole thing is, um, is, is a great hope that they will uh, find the church. But if they don't, then, then it's uh, uh, radically incomplete. Uh, and so it would be a great thing when we're in in, uh, in the Holy Land to um, pray for uh, pray for this situation of the Jewish people of the conversion of the ones who are simply atheistic um, for the conversion of the ones who, who, are, who have really dug their heels in um, to the old covenant and won't hear of the, any new covenant um, and um, Pray also for uh, for um, these messianic Jews who've come so far, and yet uh, they can be very anti-Catholic, of course, because uh, 
they, 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 they don't understand St. Paul really or, or Christ himself um, fully and therefore they try to make this kind of um, defense of, of um, you know, it's a kind of uneasy marriage and, and obviously it's uh, very incomplete. Um, there's, a, there's a, a tremendous amount else, but uh, over the question of, of the heavenly Jerusalem, I mean, the, the whole of the New Testament is full of it. I mean, the letter to the Hebrews is all about the, um, the fulfillment of the old covenant by the new covenant of Christ. That's what it's all about. Um, and it, it all, you know, you, you can't really read it without, I mean, people do read it without seeing the church, but it, 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 they, it's very difficult to, to interpret the letter to the Hebrews or anything of St. Paul, really, without seeing uh, the, the reality of, of, of the revelation uh, not only of Christ but of the Catholic Church um, and uh, the book of Revelation of course is always uh, the whole consummation of the uh, of the book of the Apocalypse is in the heavenly Jerusalem uh, which is uh, what we're talking about then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband I mean, it's tremendous the last three or four chapters of the book of the apocalypse are tremendous about this if they don't if, if they do, if, as it were, they don't succeed in lifting our hearts to God and, and not putting a happiness of this world first, I can't think what on earth could convert us, really, um, if you see what I mean. It's a tremendous vision uh, of, of the bride and the bridegroom, the heavenly marriage and eternal life. Uh, and that is the fulfillment. That's where our eyes always should be upturned to the heavenly Jerusalem. <coughs> And of course, it's, you know, there's temptations always on all sides along the way. And one of the temptations for the church is an over, a wrong sort of um, uh, earthly idea of the church. And that, of course, goes terribly wrong, always. Uh, the church is on the earth, but the church's heart is in heaven. And um, the church, like Christ, in a sense, um, is fulfilled by dying on the cross and rising again into eternal life like the martyrs well we should all be living like that whereas there can be a way of, of being attached to the church and, and absolutely downcast when the church seems to be suffering well we should be overjoyed when the martyrs are suffering you know our attitude to what's happening in the Middle East of course we want to help uh, uh, you know save the lives of anyone we can help of course on that level but I mean in fact if there are people dying for Christ in Africa and the Middle East and China and India and Japan well this is a wonderful glorious thing and we should be uh, praising God with 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 the martyrs in heaven this is the triumph but if we just see it, no oh gosh we've got to hear help the Christians of the Middle East in a worldly way, well that too is very good, but it's utterly blind if it isn't glorifying God for the spirit of the martyrs, and it's not helping them either. If they're only dying and we're all weeping tears, oh gosh, they've been killed, how awful it was. Instead of how wonderful it was, they've died for Christ, and there are more people in heaven now, and uh, then the Holy Spirit will grow in the church that isn't uh, being persecuted at that time. Uh, as well as in those who are being persecuted. Uh, it's the whole question of lifting our heart and living in heaven, and you won't get that from the daily newspapers, of course. Um, uh, but you get a sort of... Uh, it's not exactly a false charity, but it, it, it's, a, um, it's a very unenlightened kind of charity uh, that is just thinking in terms of... of uh, 
how awful all that suffering when in fact it is the glory of the church if there are people dying for Christ it's the victory of the church too because it's that that brings the Holy Spirit and it's that that converts the world so we look at Africa or anywhere else where these terrible things are happening then then you know insofar as there is faith and faithfulness in that suffering well then that is the, that is the victory but the victory finally is in heaven and if we're looking for a kind of victory on this earth that is kind of the beginning of a whole wrong understanding of everything because it's unconverted really um, Gosh, anyway, I, I wasn't going to, I was going to rely more on questions than on what I was going to say. If, if, if supper is at 7.30, then we, we've got about 10 minutes, if anyone would like to ask any question. <coughs> well, I, th I think that um, a greater love of the, the, the Word of God and of the Gospels which reveal the heart of God to us so that um, we, so that our heart is uplifted um, and not uh, um, centered on this earth um, so I, I would say that and I would say uh, speaking of myself and all of us we all need that continually that that kind of uplifted eyes and uplifted heart that is, that is the heart and eyes of faith that really is worshipping God and not some kind of hope, hope for a sort of happiness of this world somehow things will work out and so on things um, things aren't going to work out in fact on this <coughs> earth it doesn't seem at all the, the, the working out of it is the glorious vocation of this of this world um, to, to go up in smoke and, and be succeeded by the new heavens and the new earth um, which we can, in which we can already worship that the mass takes place in heaven the, the more we see it in that way that the holy land is heaven whereas if we more and more keep repeating the holy land, the holy land and Haifa's there and Jerusalem is there uh, it's all very good because historically we need to see the roots of in history of everything so it's very important but if we remain at that level um, we haven't really seen the holy land at all you know we've been living in some kind of um, uh, mistaken understanding of, of life and of history and of everything else you know um, so we, uh, the more uh, so our fruit would be that when we're at the mass we really we're in heaven where the mass takes place what Jesus is offering now, his body and blood to the Father. Whereas, of course, it's only too easy if, we're, if our heart is on the, is, is on the earthly um, sharing in that, that, that in fact we, we lose that vision altogether and, and end up, as I say, I think, you know, if a person's happiness is... Um, of this world, uh, trying to live a happy life in this world, well that is an unconverted state. A converted state is, is seeking the happiness of heaven, isn't it? And that's where the Holy Spirit helps, so... Um, but prayer, I mean, prayer and, and say the Gospels especially, um, but the whole, I mean, Isaiah is... Um, I don't know, I'm trying to think what we've seen at the moment of Isaiah but I mean Isaiah is a tremendous light on Christ himself and um, the, the more we, we understand of the history say uh, of Isaiah when, when um, uh, you know the, the um, the, the uh, Judah and, and the Northern Kingdom, they were both being uh, destroyed by, um, by the, first the Assyrians and then by the Babylonians in history. The more we understand that, because in fact we've been in these places and we know a bit more about it, we know where, where the Assyrians came from and where the 
Babylonians came from, then the more we learn the history of the Old Testament, then of course the more we can understand then his, Isaiah himself was lifted up. You know, he saw the Lord high and lifted up in the temple and his train filled the temple and all the angels saying, holy, holy, holy. Well, that's the same Isaiah who later is speaking about the Passion, you know, the chapter 53. Um, the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And, and uh, so that the more we know, say, Isaiah, then we need to know the history for that. And this can all help tremendously. Um, uh, to know, and then we can, we can see the, the, the wonder of the Holy Spirit preparing uh, people's minds and hearts for them to understand what Christ, uh, who, who he is when he comes. Um, and uh, so I, I think it's very important in understanding the Old Testament and very important also in coming close to Jesus on this earth. But if we don't pass from Jesus on this earth, to Jesus in heaven and then the church with its heart in heaven that then uh, we haven't really uh, been so much helped by our visit to the Holy Land but if we if that does happen well then it, it's a wonderful thing you know to see where he actually walked and uh... Father I think that the Holy Spirit is the one who to England mm -hmm. is the, um, the exuberance, the exuberance that um, our, our coach has given us, mm -hmm. and also the exuberance from the homily you've given us. Mm -hmm. And in that exuberance, it's not all about history, but of course it has to be about history because many amongst us are theologians or scientists or many of our colleagues want proof of everything. And there is mysteries that we don't have proof of. But coming here, and I'm only my first day in Jerusalem in my whole life, I feel that I feel so much closer to heaven. You could. Well, that's exactly what, exactly what we, we, I hope we all do, you know. By the time we plan, we get back. I hope we will feel closer to heaven. I mean, in a literal way, we feel closer to heaven because we're more centered on heaven. That's what Christ came to do. Lift up your hearts, we say when we say the Mass, don't we? We've lifted them up to the Lord. Well, we must do it. We mustn't be telling a lie at that moment in the Mass. Um, in a way, Father, the, the Holy Spirit is the one who is the Shalem, Mm. We're being in peace. Yes. And at the same time when Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem, then he rose again. And they actually appeared to the disciples and said, and Peace I give you, my peace I give you, which the world cannot give. Yeah. In a way that was um, showing what was just said. But, yes. You know, he mm. was giving yeah. a, a, a peace which was not worth it. Yes. And the, the disciples actually started from Jerusalem, come out mm. throughout the, all the worlds. Yeah. to bring that peace yeah. of Christ to the world. So he's yeah. actually yeah. showing at that moment the resurrection. He wants people to move away from the earthly to the spiritual yes. to yes. heaven. Yes. In, in That's it. Very significant yes. moment. Yeah. She said the Bible is a simple word of scripture has so much significance yes. yeah. if one studies it. Yes. Yes. Yes, there's a verse of a poem that says what you were just saying. Um, I, I am risen and I am with you, not as the world is the peace I give you. And uh, oh, there are many poems like that and many verses in the scripture like that. But, you know, that, uh, that is, that's the purpose of it, of, of coming here. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.